Personally, I would try to avoid layer 2 gateways as much as possible because you're just extending the existing bridging problems into the overlay domain. But of course, there are always exceptions. For example, you might need to connect physical servers with the virtual environment. You're migrating servers into the new private cloud, for example. And you have some servers that will never be virtualized, like, for example, a database server running on an IBM Unix machine. And you have to preserve the IP addresses during the migration. Maybe later you will renumber and get rid of layer 2, but for the migration purposes, you have to have the servers in the same VLAN. So there are cases where you need a layer 2 gateway between overlay segment and an outside VLAN. Even though I would totally discourage that, I do recognize that there are cases where you need layer 2 gateway with a remote site. So, for example, a customer migrating a workload into the cloud and eventually all the workload will be in the cloud. But still, as they are migrating things across, they can't migrate everything at once and so they have layer 2 connectivity. When considering that, do remember that every WAN link has fixed bandwidth and non-zero latency. So first you have to ask yourself, will my application work with that bandwidth when it's stretched? And what will be the performance of my application when I introduce the extra latency? If that's okay, go ahead and migrate. Otherwise you need plan B. The other use case is where you already have layer 4 to 7 services, for example, you have an F5 load balancer or you have ASA firewall. Those physical appliances only work with VLANs, they only support VLAN trunking, and you would like the virtual machines that are now in the overlay world to work with those appliances, so somehow you have to connect the two worlds, and sometimes the only thing you can do is a layer 2 gateway. NSX in multi-hypervisor environments solves the gateway problem or challenge with a generic mechanism. You have the gateway nodes, you have the service nodes that help the gateway nodes. We discussed the service node previously, and then you have the hypervisors. So gateways provide connectivity between the overlay network and the physical world. And the service nodes help between the hypervisors and gateways primarily through the initial flooding phase when people are still discovering each other. And then the unicast data flows directly between the hypervisors and the gateways, so the service nodes are out of that. They only perform flooding. You can deploy layer 2 or layer 3 gateways on the gateway nodes. So the gateway nodes are generic resources that you can use to implement numerous gateway services. A single gateway node can run numerous gateway services, and in layer 2 world, each gateway service connects one overlay network to one VLAN. And you can use trunking on the service node and connect many overlays to many VLANs, but on one gateway node, one overlay network connects to one VLAN, so there's one-to-one -one mapping. And you can use more than one gateway node for every layer 2 gateway service for active, passive, high availability. So you configure the gateway service, you associate it with one or more gateway nodes, and then it runs on one of them, and if that one fails, it flips over to the other one. As I said, a single gateway node, the physical box, can support many services, but they all have to be layer 2 or layer 3. And you configure which gateway services run on which gateway node. Service nodes, on the other hand, are managed totally by the hypervisor. You don't see that. Then we have the high-speed layer 2 gateways that could be any physical switch that supports unicast VXLAN encapsulation. And here's the important part, the new OVSDB protocol. I got a question previously that I haven't answered yet. OVSDB protocol is an IETF draft. So if you want to see how it looks like, 
you can read that draft. But that draft specifies primarily the protocol, not the data exchanged in the protocol. So in this particular case, the data sent from the controller cluster to the switches would include information like MAC address A maps to hypervisor 1 and MAC address B maps to hypervisor 2. And what the controller would get back from the gateways is when a gateway sees an outside MAC address, it would report, I can see this MAC address, use me to reach it. And then the traffic flow, even though this is using now a different protocol, is totally identical to the NSX layer 2 gateway scenario. As I said, everything in the physical layer 2 gateways is programmed from the controller through OVSDB, and that should include both logical interfaces and VXLAN forwarding entries. How do we implement high availability in the layer 2 gateway scenario? First, the controller is monitoring the individual gateway nodes. And if a gateway node fails, the service automatically flips over on another gateway node. So if you have two gateway nodes that are offering the same layer 2 gateway service, the flip over is automatic. Now, someone might configure a different layer 2 gateway service and accidentally connect it to the same outside VLAN. And now you have a forwarding loop. To prevent that, the gateway nodes use CFM on the outside VLAN to detect other gateway nodes that are connected to the same VLAN. So with CFM, we stop the forwarding loops between the physical network and the overlay network. The other thing the gateway nodes are doing is they listen to spanning tree updates. So they are not participating in spanning tree, but they're listening to spanning tree. If there is a change in spanning tree topology, then like every decent bridge, they go into listening mode. And in the listening phase, hopefully they see or don't see the CFM updates from other gateway nodes so that after they start forwarding, they don't cause a forwarding loop question what is CFM? CFM is connectivity and fault management and it's a standard Ethernet protocol. Are layer 2 gateways only high availability, so active-passive, or are they active-active gateways? For every layer 2 gateway service, there is only one layer 2 gateway node that provides that service at any time. But the other gateway node that is backup for this service can at the same time offer layer 2 gateway service to a different overlay segment and VLAN. How quick is the failover after the active gateway failure to the backup one? Our documents say about 1.2 seconds, so I would just you know, call it under 2 seconds. Do service nodes scale active standby or N plus one? Well, service nodes are not a problem. Service nodes are managed automatically by the controller. But if I turn this question around, do gateway nodes have active standby or is it N plus one redundancy? No, you can only have two gateway nodes in a layer two gateway service, and you can have multiple layer two gateway services. That makes sense. So I could have, for example, three layer two gateway services, each with two nodes. And I think you're going to get to the layer three stuff next, but the layer three I is will. a bit different. Yeah, we can scale that out. Can the layer two gateway have a trunk port? Absolutely. That's the idea. Is there high availability concern with high speed gateways? Well, like with the, all the mechanisms we've been discussing now, we have to figure out that the gateway has failed and flip over the service to another gateway. Are multiple layer 2 gateways supported per single overlay layer 2 segment? A single layer 2 logical segment, like a logical switch within NSX, would be mapped to a single layer 2 gateway service node. What's the throughput of the gateway node? Obviously, it depends on the hardware you use, but... Rough, we're, we're seeing close to 10 gigabits. 
let's move forward to the NSX for vSphere. Here, the situation is very similar, but slightly different. The gateway service has data and control plane. The data plane is implemented in ESXi kernel, and the control plane is implemented with NSX Edge distributed router. Now, I know it doesn't sound right that a distributed router performs layer 2 gateway service, but that's how the thing is called. And you can have multiple VXLAN to VLAN bridges per layer 2 gateway. Obviously, you need high availability, so you would run two copies of the distributed router control VM, and one of them would be active, the other one would be backup. And the placement of the control VM controls which ESX kernel will do bridging between a VXLAN segment and an outside VLAN. The kernel on which the active control VM runs does the bridging. Of course, it also has to perform dynamic Mac learning. And there is a special trick that is used within the virtual switch, so called sync DV port that is used to attract VXLAN traffic to unknown destinations so that it can be forwarded to the outside world. If you really want to stretch things across multiple sites, the NSX for multi-hypervisors has layer 2 extension capability, and what it does is it establishes encrypted tunnels between service nodes. So you have service node here, you have another service node here, then you're establishing an IPsec tunnel between the service nodes, and the service nodes then help the virtual switches in different hypervisors to communicate. And of course, on the other side of the service node, you could have a layer 2 or layer 3 gateway, and if you do that, then you will extend an overlay network to this site here and connect it to the site VLAN, which is, for example, a scenario you could use in migration into the cloud. I'm getting a number of questions on QoS. Most of the questions go along the lines of, do we get DSCP visibility in the transport network? And yes, the answer is you do. So NSX for multi-hypervisors has two options. Either it can take DSCP value that was set by VM and copy that into the transport header or it can ignore the DSCP value and set its own DSCP value in the transport header. So NSX for multi-hypervisors uses sort of, if you wish, service provider model, where you either trust your customer because he's paying you to trust him, or you don't trust your customer and you set the QoS values on your own. NSX for vSphere, is slightly different because there with vSphere 5.5 you will have the capability for full five tuple matching and marking and with that you will be able to set DSCP on the overlay traffic to anything you wish in the hypervisor and that DSCP value is then copied into the transport envelope. Is there any word on NSX for vSphere release date? I think what we're targeting is October if I'm allowed to say that, but I did, so sometime next month. Do you need jumbo frames in the transport network? I should have mentioned that, of course you do. If you want to transport 1500 byte IP MTU across VMs and you really want that, you don't want to play with the MTU sizes on the VMs, then you need something like 1600 MTU in the transport network. The other one are TTLs copied as well from the overlay into the transport network, no, they should not be copied. Because the overlay network is in, let's say, layer 2 case, emulating a single layer 2 subnet. So you should really not copy TTL from the VM traffic into the underlay traffic, because you want the transport fabric to be able to transport the data to the other hypervisor, regardless of how many hops are in there. 
and you also don't want to copy the transport TTL back into the VM TTL because that would break the layer 2 subnet mechanism. And when we do distributed routing, then of course we have to decrement TTL to prevent forwarding loops. What's the best practice for DCI solution, layer 2 or layer 3? Well, you probably know what my answer is. Layer 3 is always better, but with NSX you can get both. To find other virtual networking, data center and cloud networking webinars, visit ipspace.net.